Duke, he steps up, throws to the end zone. Olsen, touchdown! How about that? Now, picked off. Akeem Tlaib. It's a pick six and a foot race that Tlaib will win. Rivers goes, and it's knocked down incomplete by Randall. And the Packers are going to survive San Diego's best punch. And now... Move the Sticks with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. What's up, everybody? DJ, Bucky, week six, Buck. It was uh, one of the better weeks we've had. in Competitive games, future playoff teams uh, squaring off. Exciting weekend of football. Yeah, really good weekend of football. Got a chance to see the unbeaten stay unbeaten. Um, Carolina obviously being a surprise going on the road to Seattle, seeing their young guys step up and make plays. I think, to me, that was the biggest surprise of the weekend, how well they played in Central Link Field. Yeah, we've got a lot of ground to cover, and I'm going to get to TD, and he can kind of uh, give you a clue of what all the ground we're going to hit today. We're going to obviously get to Cam Newton and a bunch of other topics, but I'm going to hit you off with some numbers. I'm going to see if you can tell me what they are. Okay, you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. All right, 5,643. Uh, that would be probably the record for NFL passing yards. That's how many yards Phillip Rivers is on track for right now. <laughs> 5,643 Well, I mean, yards. if you're going to throw the ball 60 times a game, that, that helps. should put you on track. Did you hear Aaron Rodgers after the game? He was like, I, I would like to throw the ball 60 times a game. <laughs> uh, he, was a little, he, he was a little bit jealous. All right, so now you kind of know the theme. Now I'm going to give you a projection. Okay. So, 1,936. Chris Ivory's rushing total. Hopkins. Nuke, Nuke Hopkins is on pace for that? 1,936 yards to go with 139 catches is what he's on track for right now. So no, Both big, both would be records. Yeah, bo- both guys, uh, big, time, uh, big time seasons they're off to right now. I know we're going to get to Cam Newton, a lot of other stuff, and let's, let's uh, let TD fill the folks in about what else we have coming up, TD. What we got? What's going on, guys? Today we're going to talk about Cam, obviously, and a big comeback against my Seahawks. What a shame. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the Jets, going to get Coach Billick and his great stuff, his tweets. So, you know, fun show we have planned. And also, we're checking on Marcus Mariota, my boy. Oh, yeah, we got the, we have, yeah, yeah, we got, we got plenty of stuff on your boy. Well, Buck, we'll get, we're going to get to Mariota a little bit later on here, what's wrong with him. But let's start off with, with what's right with Cam Newton. What are you seeing from him? He's playing winning football. You know, I think the big thing with Cam has been a guy that is, he has always been a guy that's tried to put the whole offense on his back, meaning making plays with his leg, his arms. He would get into trouble when he was trying to force things down the field, really trying to make a play. And in talking to the Carolina coaches, they said the big thing for them is to understand that this defense is really the strength of the team. Don't put them in a compromising situation by turning the ball over, giving the opponent short fields. If you do that, they'll win a lot of games. And they say they've seen the growth in his ability on the practice field. They've seen a growth in his management skills when it comes to game time where he's not making kind of those silly blunders that have plagued him. I think he's a guy that is really stepping up and making a ton of plays. And even though he had two turnovers, the way he bounced back in the fourth quarter, the way he played down the stretch really shows that he can be a guy that they can hang their head on when it counts. Two things that he does well, I think that he's really improved on. Um, you talk about recognition, you know, being able to recognize what what they're doing to you, where you can go with the football, mm-hmm. and, and then being, you know, I use that term selectively aggressive. So it's kind of what I talked about yeah. with Andy Dalton previously, is knowing when it's time to take those shots. And, and don't have to do that all the time, but you can't do it none of the time either. So you got to yeah. be selectively aggressive. I think he's done that, and I think just his overall understanding of what teams are trying to do against them. Uh, it's pretty amazing, and he's doing it really with Greg Olson, who's a premier tight end. We've talked about him in a previous episode. Uh, but then on the outside, you've got Funches, who's a young guy, and then you've got Ted Ginn, who's just really yeah. is a journeyman at this point in time. Jaco uh, Cotri. Jaco. I mean, like, so it's, it's impressive. Now, let's not, let's not shortchange this Carolina defense. Even when, when Keekley was out, they were rolling. Now they get him back, and, uh, and they were stifling when they needed to be in this game as well. You know, the, the thing that I will give the Carolina Panthers credit for is even though they lavished a big contract on Cam Newton, they haven't changed the way that he plays. They still ask him to do the things that he's always done successfully down near the red zone in the end zone. He's running the ball. He's making plays with his legs. He does a great job of protecting himself. Also, he's a bigger body. And so it's different when he flees the pocket as opposed to a smaller guy like a Russell Wilson. But in allowing him to play in his comfort zone, where he's still able to do some of the things that he did very, very well at Auburn while still trying to catch up to playing the game in a very traditional manner, that offensive coordinator, Mike Shula, has done a really good job of crafting that offense to allow him to continue to be himself. I, I was trying to think of, I remember when he was coming out, you know, who the comparisons were, you know, with him to different guys. And, 
You can talk about Roethlisberger because of the size, but even body types, Cam is just so different. I mean, he has no no fat on him. He's got mm-hmm. those really, really broad shoulders. 6'5 plus, 250 pounds. To me, it was like he was a supersized Culpepper. Because Culpepper had that sturdy, just thick frame. He was Culpepper was a great athlete before he had those yeah. knee injuries. And uh, But Culpepper, I want to say, was about 6'3". Uh, yeah, I mean, he Cam, Cam is a, a much five. taller guy. I, he, he, he's a... He's, well, he's a unicorn, but I mean, there's nobody, there's nobody really to compare Cam Newton to. You know, the only guy that I could compare to coming out was Big Ben, and the reason I compared it to Roethlisberger was the size, the frame, the natural arm talent. Had the opportunity to watch him at that media workout. Trent Dilfer and I were there in the building. George Whitfield ran the workout, and George Whitfield had also um, worked with Roethlisberger doing one of the times. This is what suspended. this is what made George Whitfield a household name. Absolutely, made him a household name because what we saw with Cam, and the thing that I saw with Cam. There is, I, I thought at Auburn, he was the Pied Piper. I thought he was a natural leader. I saw how the players gravitated to him, and he was a winner. Won a JC National Championship at Blend Junior College, goes to Auburn, and in one year they win a national title. And I felt like he played well in big games. And amid all the drama and controversy that surrounded him, I felt like he continued to play well. And there was something about that resiliency, that perseverance, that grit that he showed then that allowed me to believe that he would be fine as a franchise quarterback. No, he's look, he's playing really well, and the numbers aren't going to wow you. I mean, he's 26th in passing yards in the NFL right now. So yeah. if you want to go solely off the numbers, you're going to say, okay, he doesn't belong up there. And I still don't. Look, uh, TD, I'm sure you probably want to jump in on this, but I, I still, and I am a huge Cam Newton fan and supporter. I mean, he's not a, he's not a top five guy with the, with the caliber of quarterbacks we have at the very top. But he's in that he's in that next group for me. Let's do it this way. Which quarterbacks would you rather have over camp? Oh, uh, so not a lifetime achievement award. Do you want to hit this us with season, names? Next season. So uh, okay. Hit us with go. names and we'll try. Right, let's go. Let's start at the top. Let's start with Philip Rivers. I would still take Philip Rivers. So Philip Rivers is playing at high, higher level as anybody in the NFL right now. I mean, now. He, he, he rattled off the numbers on what he projected. 5,600 yards is hard to sneeze at that. He's the ultimate competitor. I still would take Philip Rivers over Cam Newton in that, in that conversation. Yeah. Who else you got? Uh, another tough one, Big Ben. Oh, it's not. That's Big Ben. It's not, it's he's not, got hardware yeah, and he's yeah. got the, the, the skill not set. A, not a lifetime achievement award. Guys. I mean, like Come right, on, right now, big, big Big Ben is playing the best football that he's played in his career prior to his injury. I'm, I'm going with Ben. And all right, let's, let's, I would though, all, all, on the other side of that though. I would take Big Ben as well, but I, I would love to see Cam Newton get a chance to drive that car in, in Pittsburgh because he has well, like, any weapons like that. I actually think that Ben Roethlisberger is the blueprint for Cam Newton. Early in Ben's career, those first three or four years, they had a pitch count on Ben where anytime they passed over 23 to 25 times, they lost because it was built on the running game. As Cam continues to mature, I would like to see him eventually take over the offense and have control, much like Ben Roethlisberger has. But it's an organizational decision. You have to kind of stack the lineup with the guys that can allow him to grow and become that. And you got to be patient to get, deal with some of those growing pains when you go from being get a Kelvin Benjamin back next year is going to help as well. Yeah, I, I do. No like, question. I hate to do this, up. but what about Russell Wilson? Who would you rather have, Cam or Russell? <sighs> this is a difficult one for me because skill set wise, you know, the, the 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 Cam is just so rare and so unique. But Russell Wilson, you know, in terms of being a touch passer and doing some different things, making all these different variety of throws, as well as extending plays to throw, man, and he's got the win, the the wins to back him up. I just man. That I think, look, Buck, we always say, right, and you're in the draft room and you have similar grade or the same grade on a player, you're going to find something to separate them. I'm, I'll go with the bigger guy. And I'll yeah, take Cam. I'll go with the bigger guy. I think the big, the interesting thing would be if we swap places. If we put Russell Wilson in Carolina, can we say that Russell would lift the Panthers that's a great, that's a great and point. put them to back to back division titles? Maybe. But I absolutely know that if we put Cam in Seattle with the Legion of Boom and that defense and Marshawn Lynch behind him, they absolutely would have achieved the same things, if not more. I'm going to go with Cam because, to me, he's a bigger, more dynamic player, even though Russell is probably more polished as a pocket passer. Yeah, no, no question. And both of them, to their credit, have played behind offensive lines that are not the most skilled in the National Football League, to put it, to put it lightly. Who, you want anybody else in here, TD? Uh, fellow NFC South quarterback, Matt Ryan. I go Matt. I would go Matt Ryan. You know, look, I, I know Cam mm. has a unique, unique ability, but I think Matt Ryan, just in terms of what he's proven over a period of time, and more in the passing game, more being on Matt Ryan than is on Cam. But Cam gives you the added benefit of the run. I know I'm talking in circles here. Uh, I think I would still go. I think I would still lean towards Matt Ryan. Yeah, that's hard. You know, it, it, 
I, I would love to see what Kyle Shanahan would do with a Cam Newton type. We saw what he did with RG3, and I think Cam is far superior to what RG3 was even during his heyday. Bigger body in that offense with the zone, zone-based zone running game, adding some pistol in the zone read. I'm going to take Cam over Matt Ryan, even though I like Matt Ryan. <laughs> you, know you know what? Because you're, you're hitting me on the fly with this, TD, and I'm listening to Counselor Brooks and the case that he just made, I, I can be uh, I can be convinced on that one. I might change my vote. I'll change my vote and go Cam Newton over Matt Ryan. You, you brought up a good point. It's it's hard when you when you sit here and say the situation they're in right now, but if you swap them, and that makes you think about things through a whole different yeah, you way. Give them, you give them a Julio Jones, you give them a, a dynamic run game where they have the zone based thing with Devontae Freeman or whatever, and Kyle Shanahan calling the plays is different. I think the big choice for me, and, and looking at the number one. So let's just talk about some of the previous number ones. Andrew Luck, Matthew Stafford, I, I, I won't even put Sam Bradford in this equation, but just of those two guys, if we had to rank the three, Cam, Andrew, Matthew Stafford, how would we rank those guys? I mean, I would go Andrew Luck would still be number one for me. Mm -hmm. I would have him number one. Stafford, man. You're not thinking Stafford over Cam, are you? He's number one. You, no, I, have, I mean, I have Andrew. No, no, I have, no, I'm I'm saying, Andrew, saying, I have like, Andrew Luck like, number one. I, would, I, would, number one I, I know, but I'm one overall. I would go. I would Arm go talent. Luck. 41 Cam. touchdowns in a year. That was like four years ago. Doesn't matter. 41. <laughs> He's still young. I, I still go. I would go Luck, Cam, Stafford. Stafford, which we get into him a little bit uh, later on here. He, he kind of had that game. We were, we were anticipating this was going to happen. Eventually, it was going to come together for him. Arm talent wise, I mean, they both have rare. I mean, all all these guys have rare, rare arms. But I mean, if you, how about just arm strength between these three, Buck? I I think um, I would go. Man, Cam's got a huge arm, yeah, but I, I I still think Stafford has probably a stronger arm. I, I think Stafford, luck, Cam, yeah. than Luck. Yeah, I would say Luck would rank third in all of those guys when it comes to arm strength, and maybe even arm talent. I think the thing that separates or puts maybe Luck ahead of Cam and Stafford as a passer, he has. I, I mean, I want to say he has a better regard for the ball, but he has been plagued with turnovers as well. I think he's a more natural pocket passer in terms of throwing with timing and anticipation, doing the concepts that you want to see. But also, he gives you that athleticism that Cam has. Um, I would say Luck, Newton, Stafford. But I'm happy with all three of those quarterbacks because I believe in Matt Stafford. I still believe that he can be salvaged. All right, we, we got to hit Coach Billick when he comes on a little bit later on the show with that question. I'd like to get his answer on that one. Uh, in that game, though, you've got the good of, of Cam Newton. You've got on the other side, what's wrong with the Seattle defense, Buck? I mean, the, I mean we, we look at the tape of this, and you look at the, these plays, they've given up against tight ends, and the, and the big one to Greg Olson. That is the weapon in this game. When you look at the video, what the heck happened? You know, it's, it's, it's crazy to me. Um, this is a secondary that has been together for a number of years, do a great job of communicating. Every time you hear them, they talk about their ability to be on the same page. But yet on this play, they were clearly off on the wrong page. Simple seam concept with an angle route by the back on the backside. Richard Sermon's on the single receiver side with Greg Olson. Uh, it's, it's just one of those things where if it's cover three, someone has to carry that guy down the seam. Because in cover, in cover three, where you have three deep players, uh, you want to attack the seams. And for whatever reason, Earl Thomas didn't carry him. They didn't get it done. But then KJ Wright, screaming, KJ Wright screaming down the middle of the field, so it looks like you know, he's getting a cover two call. Yeah, and that's what they said. After the game, Pete talked about miscommunication. Richard Sherman and Earl Thomas both talked about the communication. And looking at it here, we, we can see, like, it looks like cover three up at the top. Uh, cover top three. And the reason we say cover formation. three is you got, you got Cam Chancellor in the deep middle. You also have Kerry Williams sinking back. But down at the bottom, it – it just looks like there's a miscommunication. Like, we just don't know what they're in. K.J. Wright's running the deep post like his cover two, but Earl Thomas is not playing the deep half. Yeah. And Richard Sherman, like, he was in cover two. Yeah, he's bizarre. like he's counting on Earl Thomas to be there. And the funny thing about it, they are a team that traditionally plays a single high safety look, cover one, cover three. Mm -hmm. So if they tried to add in some cover two, it's kind of deviating away from what their identity has been the last three or four years. I can't understand that. I, I, I'm, I'm surprised by it. And I would like to know, like, why would they decide to add more cover two unless they feel like they have a weak link that they have to help out in Kerry Williams? Yeah, no, it's, uh, 
it was very very interesting there, and that's just the one guy in that situation you, you can't let beat you, and that's happened. They have no closer. There's no Mariano Rivera for the Seahawks team. They've blown so many leads this year, and that to me was a sign of a great defense. I remember being around Baltimore in my time there. I mean, we had two closers. It, it was Ray and Ed, so we knew it was time to make a play. I can remember playing. we were playing against Seattle and uh, needed a comeback, needed to get the ball back, and Max Strong, who's you know as physical and yeah. tough of a fullback as you'll ever see, you know, and uh, he'd give him the ball on a dive, just trying to kill clock. And Ray butts him up and just takes the ball from him, just just took it from him. And uh, and then he'd have interceptions late in games to finish off. Ed Reed would blitz and force a fumble, would block a kick, something. We had those guys have that closing mentality, and the Seahawks have had that in the past. They don't have it this year. Yeah, for whatever reason, like it's, it's either, do we have the the, the Bengal State the XO? Um, yeah, we got to pull up in a second. Yeah, I, I think the big thing you talk about like. The closer and who's the closer for them? I would say like all of these guys are role Cam, Cam, Cam closed the game against Detroit. I yeah, give him he, that. He closes it out. He's, ball out. he's the guy Calvert. that in the middle of the field. He's the middle of the field enforcer, meaning he discourages wide receivers and running backs from venturing between the hashes. Makes those knockout plays. And so the big thing when they went to cover three is they wanted to take away the deep shots in the middle. Here we're gonna see two by two. We see Tyler Eifert. The middle of the field is open for whatever reason. Earl Thomas floats over too far to the offensive right, leaving a seam for Tyler Eifert to hit. And look, Andy Dalton does a great job with his eyes, moves him over, hits it right there. Now, this, once again, appears to be a communication error. I don't know if Kerry Williams is supposed to be off and slinking inside. But either way, they're out of position. And to be able to attack the Seahawks down the middle goes counter to what their scheme is supposed to take away. But teams have they want to funnel you. That's what that defense is based it. on: is funneling everything to, Fun, to, funnel, to their funnel, best players. Funneling inside. everything into where all the bodies are. And coming up this week, playing a Colin Kaepernick. The reason they've had a lot of success against Colin Kaepernick is because they have forced him to throw the ball in the middle, in between a lot of bodies. And young passers have a tough time fitting those balls in between multiple bodies with timing and anticipation. They normally get their interceptions off tips and overthrows. But they're not generating those plays. And so you knew that people were going to study their defense. You know that it's been the offseason project the past couple of years. they got to fix whatever the communication flaws is. And I think what you'll see from Pete Carroll, watch them be very, very vanilla and simple playing against the Niners. Watch them get back to the basics of their scheme to shore that up. Uh, one of the things I want to move on to next is kind of how the identity and personality of your coach can, in, in my opinion, can influence the coverage that you get from a media standpoint and how much attention you get. I, I just think about this. The New York Jets right now, Buck, they're 4-1. and one. Yeah. Todd Bowles is their head coach who, if you've heard – I worked, and yeah. I was with him in, in Philadelphia. If mm-hmm. you've heard Todd say more than 10 words, you, you, you're a unique person because he does not speak. Mm. So you don't hear anything about them because no. of his personality. The guy's a darn good football coach. They're 4-1. and one. What would it be like if Rex Ryan was the coach of the Jets and they were four and one? That's all anybody would be talking about. That's all they would talk about. It would be about it would be a media circus because there would be a lot of talking, um, a lot of swashbuckling, a lot of confidence coming from that group. What you're seeing from the Jets is a team that certainly takes on the personality of their coach. When I watch them play, they just go about their business. It also helps that they added some professionals, some guys that go about their business the right way. Darrell Reeves coming over, Marcus Gilchrist. Um, even Antonio Cromartie, these guys are doing the job, doing a great job of playing the game the right way. And that defense is really giving their offense plenty of opportunities. Yeah, when we look at that defense, getting Sheldon Richardson back, I believe he had half of a sack in that game. But you throw him in there with the rookie, Leonard Williams has done a nice job. Muhammad Wilkerson's having a great year. Uh, and then you've got Calvin Pryor, the resurgence of Calvin Pryor, making some plays in the back end to go along with the three secondary members you just mentioned. Th- this group is really, really low on defensive side of the ball. And Fitzpatrick... Buck, he's been sacked two times. Two times. Russell Wilson, I tweeted out, I think he's been sacked 26 times. So you're not getting negative plays uh, offensively, and Fitzpatrick can run around, make a play or two, but this team is winning because of their ground game with Ivory and, uh, and not getting negative plays and just playing dominant defense. Playing dominant defense, but on that offense, I think the, the, the big thing Chan Gailey has done is really simplified the offense. Ryan Fitzpatrick is thriving because it is a very, very simple system. He's not taking the negative plays. They're staying ahead of the chains. 
and they've been able to muster the ground attack. Chris Ivory's emerging as one of the better backs in the National Football League because they're giving him plenty of carries. They're running behind a physical offensive line. And Brandon Marshall has been everything they expected him to be as a number one receiver. He has alleviated some of the pressure on Eric Decker. He has been the guy that when they need a play, he's delivered to play in the passing game. Offensively, they're efficient. And defensively, they're dominant, creating turnovers. That is why they're 4-1 and one, one of the top teams in the AFC. Yeah, they've been generating a lot of points off those turnovers as well. I mean, when we look at the numbers here, plus six in the turnover differential. He gets six picks, recovered seven fumbles, and 24 points off that. So, look, their, their defense has been outstanding. But, Bucky, this to me is an interesting question when you're talking about building a team. They're, they're fortunate because they have a dominant front as well as a dominant secondary. But if, if I give you the choice... And you can only have one. And there's two theories on this. I'm going to give you a dominant front and an average secondary, or I'm going to give you an average front and a dominant secondary. Which way would you go? I'm going to take the average front and the dominant secondary. And that goes, goes counter to everything that I've learned growing up in the business as a player and even as a scout. I had an old coach, Willie Shaw, who was David Shaw, the head coach of Stanford, his dad. He was my defensive coordinator in Oakland. And he always said the front end can affect the back end more than the back end can affect the front end, meaning the pass rush can mask some of the flaws that you have in the back end. However, in today's game where you have so many quarterbacks that are really good at throwing the ball quick and getting it out of their hands, you can neutralize a pass rush by spreading and shredding like the New England Patriots do. So I want guys in the back end that can come up, play tight man-to-man, but also play off because now if I can hold, force the quarterback to hold in an extra count, my pass rushers can get in. So I'm more likely to invest my money in the secondary thinking that they can help my pass rush become better. It's an interesting story because it's all about resources in terms of, okay, you're going to put your resources of high draft picks and money in free agency. That, that's one way of looking at it. But it's also about the resources in terms of bodies. So if I have my financial resources in my front, then I can put extra resources and manpower to drop into coverage. So I'm rushing four. I can yep. flood zones with seven guys. You, you know, I, you, I might not have a corner that can lock you down, but I'm going to have so many bodies you got to get through, yep. and you got to get it off quick because i got four guys that are coming at you. So uh, there's different ways of looking at it. The other side is if i got a great secondary, now I can put a bunch of resources. I can get exotic and throw all kinds of overload blitzes at you. You know, it, it, and it's crazy, and ideally you would. Like, like I think they're kind of the way they're constructed. I believe the Jets – and the Broncos are constructing in a way that they can do anything they want to do defensively. They can come at you and blitz you and lock you up in man-to-man. They can sit back and play soft zone because they have enough pressure up front to be able to get after you. So when you think about those teams and the way they're built, the, the versatility that they have because of the talent that they have in place on the front line and in the secondary – allows them to be a dominant team versus anybody they face. I want to switch it back. I mentioned Rex Ryan there, and I want to go back to him in this Bills defense because you know Mario Williams came out and said he thinks he set a record for dropping in, in coverage this last week. All kind of frustrated. They hit, they hit Andy Dalton one time in that game. And this is my one, my one criticism I would have of Rex, and, uh, and this is a, you know, mm-hmm. seen this in the past. He, he wants to be so creative and so exotic, and he's going to show you all these wild looks. That's fine if you don't have the talent. If you don't have the guys, you get creative, you got to generate pressure. You've got the dudes. And the way I used to always say it, explain it, is like if you're coaching basketball and you're coaching Princeton, you're going to coach it one type of way. You're going to pass the ball around 50 times. You're going to back More cut. Creative. you got to be creative to generate some offense. Right. If you're coaching Georgetown, you're not doing that. You're throwing it, the ball out. He's, the ball at, out of he's got Georgetown. That's where he is. He's got all kinds of players. Just line them up, let them get in the right spot, and let them go and play. Just stop driving to fool everybody. You don't have to do that. It, it's, it's hard for coaches to look at their roster and realize, man, we have so much talent. How can I maximize everybody? How can I take advantage of everything? How can I put, I want to play for this guy and that guy and this guy and that guy and, and just showcase everything that I know with the guys that I have. And I think because he comes from a Jets situation where he didn't have everything in the back end, he wants to be more creative. Whereas I've learned the more talented you are, the simpler. Simple. That's you have what to that's be. what had the Seahawks had done over the last three years. Simplify, allow your guys to play fast, allow them to flow freely to the ball, you'll get better results. So yeah, maybe they've gotten away from just kind of being simple, letting those guys hunt. Because Jim Schwartz did it last year in a very simple fashion, didn't blitz as much, allowed their front forward to pretty much dictate everything, had a lot of success. 
Rex might have to scale that thing back a little bit to get the Buffalo Bills defense back on track. I know if I'm an offense, I want to see Mario Williams drop into the flat a heck of a lot more than I want to Absolutely see him going out with a quarterback. Uh, you know, look, th- this is, uh, that, that one's tough to figure out. Another couple things that are tough to figure out is what the heck is wrong with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Baltimore Ravens. These are, these are no longer teams that are playing bad. These are bad teams. And, 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 and sorry, and, uh, I'm, I'm having a tough time understanding Kansas City. I do understand the Jamal Charles injury. But I still felt like offensively, they had enough talent to be able to still be competitive and get it done. They were competitive against the Minnesota Vikings on Sunday. But not, well, not it, in the first half. I mean, it, it took them a while to even it, it, put it up took a, a fight. While, but you know what? Their defense kept them in it. And their defense can keep them in most ball games. But offensively, without Jamal Charles, it's on the perimeter guys to step up. And the main guy who has to step up is not only Jeremy Macklin, but Travis Kelsey. Where's Travis Kelsey at? This is the guy we thought would take the next step to being a great tight end. He hasn't necessarily done that, and it's really hindered and hampered some of the things that Alex Smith can do in the pocket and also up front, that offensive line. Eric Fisher has been a, a, a huge disappointment not being able to really count on him. They can't protect Alex Smith. And look, we know Alex Smith is not a risk taker, and especially if he's under duress, you're not going to get a lot of plays in the passing game. They have to retool that offense, particularly with Jamal Charles out. Yeah, they cannot move the ball offensively. And if you've got an injury to Jeremy Macklin, he went out of the game. Uh, you know, at the, end of, at the end of the day, Kelsey ended up with decent numbers. He had five for 88. But, again, a lot of that, I believe, came in the second half. Uh, first half offensively, they could not do anything. Uh, their defense, you hold the Minnesota Vikings to 16 points. That's got to be good enough to free Magic win number football 17. games. Magic number 17. Jeez. The defense hold the offense to 17 or fewer. You should win those games in national football. Uh, then we go to the Baltimore Ravens, and this, I mean, we, we touched on it on here a couple weeks ago. We put up the personnel. You know, Pernell McPhee was played, you know, had a costly penalty against the Lions, but he's played really, really well this year, uh, letting him walk out the door. They paid Jimmy Smith. He looks terrible. Uh, getting beat. Torrey Smith and Anquan Bolden, it was like the homecoming week. They came back uh, they, they against him. their old team and torched them. And, uh, look, it was – it's C.J. Mosley, I've said, does not look healthy to me. He doesn't look good. He can't run. He's not making any plays in coverage. And you lose Suggs, they can't heat up the quarterback. So that, as crazy as it sounds, I know this might be, it might be a full rebuild in Baltimore. I mean, obviously, Joe Flacco's not going anywhere. That's your centerpiece. They re-signed Marshall Yonda. I like that move. But, man, this, uh, this all of a sudden, Josh Scobie makes a kick. They're 0-6. You know, it's, it, it's, it's Crazy to think about the Baltimore Ravens struggling on defense because forever their defense has been the identity of the team, the backbone of the team. But when I look at the Ravens play now, I don't see the pass rush that I'm used to seeing. Elvis Dumerville can collect numbers, but he doesn't bring the dominant presence. And in the back end, they simply can't cover. Ladarius Webb, Jimmy Smith, uh, we saw them pick on Sharice Wright yesterday, a guy that they just signed and threw on the field. Those guys can't cover. And so... When you can't cover, you can't commit extra bodies to fortify the pass. Now you're rush. swinging back around so to your now, argument right so now. now so now, I mean, I have to I have to sell it. That was but, strong. But now you, but now you're back to having to really commit bodies, and you don't have the ability to really lock people down. Huge disappointment, and not to mention offensively, they missed Gary Kubiak. Oh yeah. Joe Flacco was really settling into his comfort zone in that offense, and Justin Forzet. Forsett was playing like a Pro Bowl player in that offense. They need to get back to that. They're not doing it with undermarked trust. I'm going to hit you with this number right here. I tweeted this out. Passing yards against the Ravens this year. I'll give you the big ones. Carr, 351. Andy Dalton, 383. Josh McCown, 457. Kaepernick, 343. And then the only two good games they've had, Peyton Manning, 175. Michael Vick, 124. And somebody hit me up two, on Twitter. Two guys that are struggling. But somebody hit me up on Twitter with a great response. He said, that's just because Manning, Manning and Vick are the only two guys to still be scared of Ray Lewis. They're only old enough. <laughs> still, but maybe Ray Lewis is going to play. I don't know. We played against Ray Lewis before. Maybe he's going to come back out again. Uh, but, I mean, those are not Hall of Fame list of quarterbacks is that, that have been torching them. But lighten uh, them up. Year. They, gotta so, get, they have to get back to who they are defensively, and you can help that by offensively running the ball and finding and rediscovering the physicality that is a hallmark of the Ravens. And that defense was built on a couple players from the University of Miami, right? Ed Ray Lewis, mm-hmm. Ed Reed, and in Baltimore, we liked going, getting guys from certain schools. We felt like, okay, University of Miami, it's been good to us. And another school that's been good to the National Football League is Clemson, especially at the wide receiver position, Buck. Sammy Watkins, we saw him this week score a touchdown before he got hurt. DeAndre Hopkins, we mentioned at the top, on pace for 1,900 yards plus. Ridiculous. He had another big game. 
And then Martavis Bryant went off in his first game of the year coming off suspension. So my question, you first of all, talk about these three guys, what makes them so special. And then do you have any history of the teams you've worked for of a school, a particular school being good to you and, and that having an influence on the draft? You know, um, this is interesting. Like the Clemson Tigers, uh, growing up in North Carolina, being a Tar Heel, lifelong Tar Heel fan and then graduating there, when I think of Clemson, I've always thought of defense. I've always thought about – they had mean, nasty guys along Trevor the Price. line. Uh, you know, you can go back. Trevor Price, Chester McLaughlin, um, Wayne Simmons played there. A number of guys that made their mark in the league played on defense. We drafted a guy, Anthony Simmons, when I was in Seattle. Defense had been their tradition. But Dabo has turned this team into really an offensive juggernaut. You think about the guys that have come out of there, C.J. Spiller, but the wide receivers. Oh, my gosh. Sammy Watkins, Martavis Bryant, DeAndre Hopkins. Right now, when I look at them, I, I see explosive playmakers, guys that can make it happen in a couple different ways. Vertical routes, they all are special in terms of being deep threats, but also their ability to make plays after the catch. Martavis Bryant's touchdown against the Steelers. His ability to weave through traffic. 88-yard touchdown on, off a 10-yard throw. Crazy. Yeah. Nuke Hopkins developing to the one of the top guys. But Martavis, this is the type of stuff that he was doing at Clemson, getting the ball to him quick. Doing it. But of all the guys there, the guy that is probably underperforming in my estimation, Sammy, Sammy Watkins. Yeah. Highest pick, but he doesn't have nearly the impact that these guys have. And he would tell you that he needs the ball more. I don't know if that's true, but right now his teammates and classmates are outperforming him when it comes to playing the National Football League. Yeah, I would like to see him get opportunity to play with a good quarterback. But, man, uh, <laughs> Landry Jones – uh, was the one throwing the ball to Martavis Bryant in, in that game, and that, which gets me to Landry Jones. But I, I know some people like get all fired up about this. He made some nice throws, but like I said, the long, the bulk of his yards came off of a ten-yard throw. Martavis Bryant did the rest. Some people are saying, "Oh, they've got their answer for whenever whoa, Big Ben whoa, uh, whoa, 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 decides whoa, to shut whoa, it down." Whoa, whoa. I, 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 I'm with you on that. Let's 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 whoa. slow that train. I don't way, know if anyone saw preseason. There was a reason why they called Michael Vick. Yeah, there's a reason why they called Michael Vick in the middle of the preseason off his couch to come in and be the quarterback too, to be number two. And that's because in preseason, Landry Jones was having a tough time moving this offense and making the big boy plays, the big boy throws. Coming in in a spot duty role, a reserve role where he didn't have any pressure, yeah, he looked good. But if teams start game planning based on what Landry Jones has done, you won't see that success continue. And I also think people were asking, why does this offense look different with Landry Jones in versus Michael Vick? Well, Landry Jones has been in the offense of yeah. Todd Haley for two or three years. He understands the time and rhythm of the passing game. He can get the ball out of his hands, understands where the playmakers are supposed to be. Granted, he can't always make the throws and get it to them. It looks better, whereas Michael Vick is still trying to figure out who's my number one, who's my number two. Landry at least understands the progressions and how to quickly get to those outlet receivers. Yeah, Landry Jones, a player coming out. And uh, I'll, I'll find my report. If he keeps rolling, I'll, I'll bring out my report on, a, on an episode down the line. But thought he was, again, kind of a late-round draft pick and uh, a lot of stuff that needed to be worked on. But, man, in the limited, uh, limited role the other day, did a nice job. Before we get to Coach Billick, do we have a couple minutes here, TD? Can we can we jump on this Mariota stuff? Yes, we Coach can. On? Boy, you know, I'm always down for some Mariota talk. Actually, the X that was going to be in the screen behind you. Oh, right look at that. Oh, watching. Look at that. It's going to be in the screen that. behind you. So, yeah. Buck, we're watching uh, watching the game, and I know he gets hurt early, and it was showed his toughness to play through that. Uh, we'll put the knee brace on uh, against a Miami front that was hungry, man. They, they got after him pretty good. But there was something that I saw in this game. It was something we talked about previously. You, you always talk about these run-pass option plays where you, you, a lot of people think of, okay, you put the ball in the belly of the back, you pull it, you run it. Now what the NFL has evolved into is now you're going to be able to pull that ball out and you're going to be able to throw it. And one of the key concepts of that we saw week one, which they torched the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with, where Marcus Mariota is putting the ball in the belly of the back and he's going to read the linebacker. You're going to see it right here. You're going to replace the linebacker if he comes downhill, and you'll see him right now. He flattens out, Levante David does. He pulls the ball, and you're going to throw into the, to the replacement area of where that linebacker settles. Oop. Look, you got not only an easy completion, you end up getting a long touchdown pass. This is week one of the season. Now we fast forward, and what we saw, we'll see this play one more time here. You see Levante David settle in. You get it behind him. You get a long touchdown we're going to see him try and run this exact same play in week what week six we're in right now against yeah. the Miami Dolphins, Buck. And he's going to come up to the line of scrimmage. He's got his eyes. He has his read. He's going to read the linebacker. 
Linebacker's going to come downhill once again. So I got an easy completion. It was a touchdown week one. I'm going to fire it off again right now, and the results are a little bit different. Yeah, the results are drastically different. It was one of the things we talked about in the draft and during the preseason. Would Ken Wizenhunt be willing to put Marcus Mariota in his comfort zone by doing some of these run-pass option things? The thing that counter to run-pass option, man-to-man. So here we see a nice disguise by the Miami Dolphins, man-to-man coverage. Linebacker goes. We see the linebacker go, which tells Marcus Mariota to throw the slant. But look at Rashad jump, boop, jumps the route, makes the play, takes it back to the zone. One of the things that Marcus Mariota will have to continue to do is he has to grow his game. People are going to jump all on that fastball, take away what he's done really, really well early in the season, and force him to make big boy throws, read, and do some pro concepts. He's going to have to mature, or we're going to continue to see more people jump these little simple stick patterns. And see, it's really, when you come to the line of scrimmage, it's just like the option. Look, I ran option when I was in college. You have a pitch man. So you're running option down the line of scrimmage. We would call it out even at the line, at the line of scrimmage in our cadence. So it would be like, okay, you know, a red 24. So it was whoever the whole player was or whoever we were going to pitch off of. So we knew we're not blocking 24. I'm going to yep. get to him, make him commit, and then I'm going to be able to pitch the ball. It's the same thing in these run pass options. So his sight line is set on one player on the linebacker. In his read, I put the ball in, I'll bring the linebacker, he comes downhill, I throw the ball. So that's very simplistic, which you can get away with in college. The problem is in the NFL – they make adjustments to that. So now the linebacker comes. Well, guess what? The safety's coming right behind him, and you're not seeing him. No, coming right behind him, and people are playing man-to-man. And the thing that Miami deserves credit for is they play man-to-man from off. So they didn't give him the indicators that, oh, I'm going to be able to fit this in, or, oh, it's man-to-man. I'm going to have to probably hand this ball off or do something else. The Tennessee Titans really did a good job very early in the year putting Marcus in his comfort zone by running a number of those plays and bubble screens getting the ball out of his hands, using the threat of his movement skills to create opportunities. But the offense was going to need to evolve for him to continue to be successful. I'm looking to see what the next phase is from that offense under Ken Wizenhunt, and I'm also looking to see how Marcus Mariota adjusts to defenses adjusting to what he's shown early in the year. He's going to have to continually adjust throughout the season to become a guy that can be a successful quarterback. That's part of playing a position in the National Football League. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to, to watch here. I think we got our coach here. We have our head coach, Brian Billick, on the line. Coach we, Billick is on the line right now. How are we doing, guys? Coach, what's happening? Hey, life's good. Just sitting here on the water, making my way back from Annapolis. Uh, oh, there's nothing better than that. Well, I, we've got a lot of ground to cover with you, and uh, I want to do it again. We've, we, hopefully we're getting you some new followers. With our with our plugs of your of your Twitter handle here, Coach, but you've got good stuff. So I want to hit you up on one of your tweets for our first question here. Uh, here's your tweet from from Sunday. Interim coach can certainly be a short term booster uh, shot for an organization, but players play for players, not coaches. Eventually, true colors return. So when I when I read that, are you buying in to, to Dan Campbell and this change that's taking place, or is this uh, is this kind of a short term deal we've got going on in Miami? Well, we'll see. They've got uh, they've got Houston next, so that's clearly a winnable game. But then they go on a six game stretch where you know now we're really going to find out. And I think that came into some of the calculation. We have the bye, we have Tennessee, we have Houston. Uh, these are winnable games. We'll let the emotion take over. The players buy into it. Uh, you know, because ultimately the players have an opportunity to say, "See, it wasn't us. It was the coach. We're really not that bad." Uh, now, you know, getting it tested these last two, this week and next, we'll see. But they, they come into a murderer's row after that, so we're going to find out. But certainly the energy was better, and the more success you have, the more they're going to buy into it. You know, Coach, not only did uh, Coach Campbell make some changes in terms of what they wanted to emphasize on offense, they ran the ball more. You could tell it was a, des- a decided effort to make sure that they got the ball to Lamar Miller's hands. But they flipped the defensive coordinator. They fired Kevin Cole, put a new guy in, a defensive coordinator, and it looked like they played a little differently on defense. When you're an interim coach and you take over, are you willing to kind of empty the bucket to make wholesale changes just to see if you can kind of light that match to ignite something that could land you the head coaching job on a permanent basis? Well, you you can go a bridge too far with that, too. When I took over in Minnesota, uh, I think it was four games into the season, uh, I took over as the coordinator. And my first game was against the Green Bay Packers of all the teams. I mean, with that rivalry, and, and I was fired up. But it wasn't until I stood on the sideline and thought, oh, my God, this is the Green Bay Packers. What do I do now? Uh, yeah, you, you, you can't make wholesale changes. They're going to be subtle. 
I don't know that the the, uh, the common fan would see other than maybe the energy level, but in terms of the coverage package, the pressures, the communication, likely you simplify a little bit so the players can feel, you know, the player is always going to say, we're doing too much or it's too complex, just let us play. Uh, and so when you simplify to a degree, yeah, that can be very successful, uh, but then you got to turn around and uh, and continue to build on the package. What they're able to do against a, a young quarterback versus what they're going to do when they get on this more legitimate run with some of the more legitimate quarterbacks, uh, yeah, you can be basic, you can be simple, but you can also be uh, stupid and not do enough that uh, you know a veteran quarterback is going to tear you up. Coach, we have a lot of catchy phrases in sports, and, and one of which is a team will take on the identity or the personality of their head coach. Is that fact or fiction? Uh, I think it, oh boy, somewhere in between. I think it's fiction from the standpoint of normally you hear that when a guy's not doing well and they want to use that to, to run your ass out of town. <laughs> uh, what will happen is obviously, if, particularly if you're there long enough, you're going to have a particular scheme that you are going to bring players obviously suited to that scheme. So, yes, they naturally inherently may have the personality of what you're trying to do because this is what you coveted. Um, and certainly you can set an emotional tempo. You know, I've said that many times. Uh, uh, coaches don't have home plate to kick dirt on like managers. <laughs> At the time, they've got to see, you know, that passion that you're fighting for them, fighting for the organization as opposed to coaches, say, a Tony Dungy that was always so cerebral, so even keeled, uh, and, and the players, you know, you want them to be that intelligent, uh, but you don't want to, them to lack emotion for the game. So, you know, I don't know. I Usually you hear that when someone wants to be critical of what the coach is doing. <laughs> you know, to that point, Coach, you tweeted, obviously took issue this preseason when Rex Ryan suggested Bill's defense was best he's ever be, been around but almost seems laughable now. Talk about that. Well, you know, and we saw it many, many times. We had Rex Wired, and, and we all agreed, you know, this, this group's pretty good. I remember we joked about him saying this is the best group he's ever had, and, and I said, you know what, I got a few Baltimore Raven uh, uh, former <laughs> players and coaches who would like to take exception with that. But at the bottom line, he's saying this is a pretty good group. What And, and there's been times uh, that they've looked really, really good, uh, but – I, I don't know. I don't. What I'm not seeing is a pass rush out of a four man rush. With what they have going defensively, I, I would have thought Rex wouldn't have to bring as much five and six man pressure to get it done. You know, we all know there's not a, a, a blitz or a pressure that Rex doesn't, hasn't seen that he hasn't just loved. Uh, but I would expect more out of the one on one matchups that you're creating. Uh, and, and then when you look in contrast, obviously to what uh, uh, they're doing with the Jets, with a group that was a pretty darn good group, um, that is a little more basic than uh, Todd Bowles, is a little more basic in terms of what Rex does. That group has taken to that very, very well. So I think on the whole, the front seven of the uh, Buffalo Bills is maybe not as dynamic as we thought they would be, at least going into the season. Coach, one of the plays we just saw here in the studio – uh, was a play where Kyle Williams was actually dropping off into coverage. And then we had Mario Williams come out and complain that he thought he might have set a record for, uh, for dropping in coverage. And a point I brought up a little bit earlier with, with Bucky, which has been one of my frustrations with Rex to a degree, is that, look, if you've got, if you've got the guys, and I use the old, I probably dated myself with this basketball analogy because I don't think Georgetown's any good anymore. But he's, he's trying to coach like he's got Princeton. You don't have to trick him. You've got Georgetown. Just, just roll the ball out there and let him play. Yeah, and we coaches, you know, we see that in a number of times. We saw that in the indie game with, with that brilliant punt formation that they used <laughs> on the fourth down. We coaches could, can get a little too cute sometimes. And, uh, you know, the phrase, uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time, uh, comes to mind. Uh, but you're right. I mean, even when, when Baltimore, you can remember this, uh, yeah. Jay, that every time I saw Peter Bowler drop into coverage, which is great to change up. You know, I'd walk over where there was Marvin or Rex and, and kind of go, is he going to do that a whole lot? <laughs> I'd really rather go the other direction. And then you got to change things up. We just talked about, you know, how, how particularly against better teams, you, you can't just do one thing and you have to change it up. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. Sometimes you can outthink it. 
And, uh, and, but also, let's, with this last game, let's give credit to Andy Dalton. You know, we're all waiting for the end of the shoot to drop with Andy Dalton, and so far it's not. He's having, at least thus far, an MVP year. Coach, one more tweet i uh, hit you with here. Uh, you talked about Stafford, said he's much like Cutler, makes amazing throws like the TD to Tim Wright, but he's wildly inconsistent, makes play calling much more difficult. What, what do you mean by that in terms of the challenge as a play caller when you've got somebody that's a little bit high and low like those two guys? Well, it's, it's like having that running back that uh, a Frank Gore versus, uh, say, a Barry Sanders. Uh, not to put them in the same category, but Barry Sanders is brilliant. You'd love to have Barry Sanders, but you're also going to find yourself in a whole bunch of second and 14s because Barry will jump cut in the hole, and then all of a sudden he'd get hit. I remember all those years I was in Minnesota and playing the, the uh, Detroit Lions. And, and, and as a play caller, although you love, because he can turn a whole bunch of two-yard runs into a 80-yard touchdowns too, uh, and you look pretty smart as a quarterback. But, but you find yourself because it is can be hit and miss, as opposed to a Frank Gore you love as a play caller, maybe not quite as explosive, but you know you're at worst you're going to be in second and eight, second and seven because he was always going to give you that positive yards. May not be the the big ones that you you had with with a more dynamic back like that. Lashawn McCoy jumps to my attention as well uh, to make it more current. A guy that uh, yeah he can pop and make a uh, cut in the hole that all of a sudden salvage something but you're going to find yourself so as a play caller it's up and down same thing with the quarterback you know that the he can make spectacular plays and can bail out a whole bunch of bad calls but you're going to find yourself in a whole lot more second longs than third and longs because of the inefficiencies on first and second down with some of the uh, inaccuracy coach we've had uh, this usc job open up out here where we are and that's created a lot of a lot of buzz and a lot of hype and a lot of talk and we've seen a bunch of names thrown out there john harbaugh's came out as a candidate and he said no uh he's happy where he is chip kelly made a joke uh when he was uh pressed on a question about being a candidate but it got me to thinking not only about uh your personal situation in the past have, have did you ever have a a college come to you for a college job and would you ever consider that and for those that don't know What's the major difference between uh, the lifestyle of an NFL head coach versus the lifestyle of a college head coach? Well, first off, in in the old days, you didn't see it much because they didn't pay as much. Now these college jobs are paying as much as pro jobs. The allure uh, for many coaches is that you're in total control. Uh, and, and, and that's why you saw guys like a Nick Saban or a Bobby Petrino go back in. Uh, and and who right up to the day they took the job said no 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 I'm not leaving so you know you can take all that with a grain of salt um, and so it, that, that's with the allure as well because you have complete control the pacing of it obviously coaches don't have to do a lot of recruiting now you're only going to play twelve some odd games by the same token the NFL the NFL if you covet being at the at the ultimate level uh, uh, you know that type of thing. Um, the, the players, you know, the coach, as a coach in college, you got to worry about the players away from the field. You do in pros, but, you know, you're not having to orchestrate. Where are they eating? Are they going to class? Are they going to study hall? That kind of thing. So, you know, it's a give and take. Uh, I think all that John Harbaugh would make a phenomenal college coach, just like the job his brother's doing in Michigan. College football probably needs a coach like John Harbaugh. But I can, you know, no reason to believe that, that, that yeah, no, there's no re- reason to believe that he tr- wants to leave the Baltimore Ravens. They're on a path now that obviously they have to reshuffle a little bit. And when, when you're having a tough season, it's always nice to be coveted. Uh, Chip Kelly, you know, at the end of the day, does not that he's not going to be successful in the NFL, but does he like working with the pro player? That, that's a legitimate question. So, yeah, I, I think you're going to see more and more pro guys go back to the college game because they covet that and the pay is darn near as good you know coach final question for me i want to tap into your old play calling days is it really important for an offense to be balanced i hear a lot of um coaches talk about a 60 40 pass run ratio or do we need to be 50 50 where we run more typically those are more defensive minded head coaches as a play caller how important is it to have balance in your offense in today's nfl Oh, you love to have bounce because it gives you the most options when you want to throw the ball, even if you're a, a pass-heavy guy, um, because the options it gives you off of play fakes and obviously the more manageable third downs as opposed to you go out and throw it 50 times, you're probably having to convert three-quarters of your third downs on third and eight plus, whereas if you're running it consistently, you're going to have a more of a third and medium, maybe some third and shorts. Now, 
knowing that in the NFL, 60-40 is pretty balanced. 60, you know, 60% pass, 40% run. Really is pretty balanced in this league. They're going to be, in a given year, there might be two, maybe three teams that come close to being 50-50. Uh, and, and, and those teams you would characterize as, oh, these are, these are uh, run-heavy teams just because of the nature of this league. You know, Coach, I know you spent a lot of time with the 49ers and Bill Walsh, and I know that he believed in using the short passing game as a run game. So if you do believe in that, if you do believe in being a team that skews more towards the passing game, how important it is, is it to build kind of some of those layups into the game plan, like we see with the New England Patriots and some of the other teams that throw it San a Diego lot. San Chargers, yeah. The Chargers that throw it a lot, but they're very, very efficient when it comes to their completion percentage and those things. Huge. That's exactly what it's about. It's efficiency. It's about putting you in those manageable third downs. Uh, we used to call them uh, exos, extended handoffs, when you were able to drop the leak outs or the little flat routes or the little uh, flare routes to your running backs, uh, the little drag routes to the tight end. Uh, and, and let them run it up with that yak yard, and that's eventually going to create. Now, you, you still got to be explosive. Now, you still you can fall in love with that too much. Uh, to or you know, it's great to, to run the ball and have those exos and, and be efficient, um, but it's hard to orchestrate a, a 12, 14, 15 play drive to have something not happen in terms of uh, uh, a, a penalty or something to take you off rhythm. Uh, and go back to my old mantra about turnovers and big plays. Uh, but you you got to be careful. Uh, it, it takes a Tom Brady. You better have a Tom Brady if you're going to live almost exclusively by those, those 10, 12, 13 play drives because bad things can happen. But the more you do that, then those defensive guys like the old cartoon, you know, with the buzzard saying, <laughs> patience, hell, I'm going to go kill something. Uh, you know, at some point you're waiting for that defense to come running up. And, and uh, the classic Bill Walsh, yeah, every play is designed to have that efficiency, but there are very few plays in the Bill Walsh run offense that didn't have an explosive component to it, the big post over the top, that given the right look, that it wasn't there for you and didn't have to actually be called. You were always aware of it, even though 80% of the time you were going to go for the more efficient throw. Coach, you, you brought the goods again uh, this week, and we're, we're excited about you doing this with us every week, although I will leave you with this. 65 uh, pass attempts for Phillip Rivers – that's no big deal to a guy who went to BYU. That's all. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> that, hey, that's just we're just warming up. In my day, 65 passes. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Coach, you got a, another article coming out this Wednesday. You've been contributing on the website as well. People can check that out uh, at NFL.com. It's Coach Brian Billick, and he joins us each and every week here on Move to Six. Thanks, Coach. All right, guys. Enjoy it. All right, Buck, there's, uh, there's Coach Billick, always entertaining. I love how we can uh, use his tweets to kind of drive drive that segment. He is, he is very, very interesting. I love how he gives strong opinions. Uh, I feel like I always learn something when I come away from talking to Coach. I've told you the story before, right, how we, one year in the draft room he came in uh, to thank all the scouts and he gave us each 1000 bucks out of his own, out of oh, his own pocket. Yeah. Uh, that's what kind of guy Coach is. Knew we had been traveling and been working hard, and so – he just came in and said, hey, you know, I want to thank you guys. It was 1000 bucks, And uh, we went and bought a computer. Went and bought a, a – a, oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what kind of computer. Can I say it, TD? Am I allowed to get sure trouble? Sure you can. Go ahead. I was just bought like a, way back when. I bought a Mac computer in 2006. Mm -hmm. We still – the kids still have it. So it's in our, like, playroom. So the kids use it for their that? homework. So we call it the Billick. We've got the Billick computer. So that's the kind of guy – The kind of guy coach is. Well, Buck, it's been, uh, it's been a fun, fun episode. A lot of ground covered. If you're listening to us, we had some XO tapes, which are some uh, breakdown tapes of some of the plays we discussed. So if you want to check that out, you can check it out on YouTube, on the NFL channel, on the Movie we Sticks playlist, as well as uh, iTunes. Stats. What's up? Yeah, we also have a bunch of stats flying on through the show. Essentially, your oh. tweets, like the tweets you put up, all the stats. And the, if you want to feel smarter about the game, watch us on YouTube. Yeah, so you can listen to it as well, but you'll get more, more bang for your buck if you check us out. Uh, on YouTube again, NFL channel, uh, Move the Sticks playlist. You can find us there as well as listen on iTunes, uh, NFL.com slash podcasts. And, uh, Buck, this is episode one of the week. I know we've got some some strong stuff coming up uh, later on in the week. Yeah, looking forward to talking about some of that stuff later in the week, previewing some of the games, and also just delving into that scout school talk. we we got to get some updates, by the way, on our total downloads and how we're doing so far in the history of Move the Sticks. Off to a good start, and thanks again for listening to us. We appreciate it. Thanks for downloading Move the Sticks with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. For more, go to nfl.com slash podcasts.